Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Omnipod. Simplify life with diabetes. By inhaled insulin, fast in, fast out, fits your lifestyle. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, could this finally be a big shakeup in the price of insulin? Civica RX plans to sell the most popular types of fast and long acting for a flat price of $30 per vial. They're already moving ahead. We have the uh, plant under roof. Uh, we're finishing the interior of the plant and equipment is starting to arrive. We plan to make manufacturing runs in the plant by the end of this year and be ready to make the insulins in 2024. That's Ned McCoy, Civica's chief operating officer. He explains why they're confident this will work, who will be able to buy the finished product, and what Civica RX is all about. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. You know we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. I am your host, Stacey Sims. My son was diagnosed with type 1 more than 15 years ago, just before he turned 2. My husband lives with type 2 diabetes. I don't have diabetes, but I have a background in broadcasting, and that is how you get this podcast. And as the U.S. Senate continues to debate a copay cap for insulin, I thought it would be a good idea to talk to some people who are trying to lower the price for those without insurance. You'll recall a few weeks back, I talked to JDRF CEO Aaron Kowalski. They had helped fund this group, and we spent the episode talking about that. But there were a lot of questions remaining. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with Civica RX. Little bit of explanation. The plan here is to make insulin available for $30 a vial and $55 for a package of pens. And this would be what's called biosimilars, basically the same medication as Humalog, Novolog, and Lantus. If you're not familiar, and this is complicated, a generic drug is identical to the original in the chemical composition. But biosimilar drugs are considered highly similar, close enough in duplication to accomplish the same result. Both Lilly and Novo Nordisk produce a generic to their insulin. It's insulin Lyspro for Humalog and insulin Aspart for Humalog. But when we refer to generic drugs, we usually mean medication made by a company other than the one selling the original medication, right? It's supposed to be about competition and lowering prices. So there's really not a true generic insulin by that common definition. The one that comes the closest we do mention in this interview, and that is Semgly similar to Sanofi's long-acting Lantus and made by a different company. In July 2021, the FDA cleared Semgly as an interchangeable trusted source insulin. That was the first time regulators allowed that kind of label for a biosimilar product, such as insulin. What does that mean? Well, Semgly, they say, has no clinical difference between Lantus. So pharmacists, in states that allow it, can switch out Lantus for Semgly, possibly saving the patient money, without first asking the prescriber or insurance company. So that's a big difference. You don't have to go looking around for coupons. You don't have to know. The pharmacist can just do it for you. You'll note that we are less than three minutes into this podcast, and it's already gotten ridiculously complicated. And that's par for the course when you talk about the price of insulin, right? My guest this week is trying to do something about that. I'm talking to Ned McCoy, the chief operating officer of Civica RX. McCoy is no stranger to healthcare. He worked for Abbott for more than 30 years. But Civica is a very different company. It was created by hospital systems and philanthropies in 2018 to reduce and prevent chronic drug shortages in hospitals and the price spikes that often go with them. Its mission is to make quality generic medicines accessible and affordable, and it's governed by hospital systems like the Mayo Clinic and Kaiser Permanente and philanthropies committed to improving health care. My chat with Ned McCoy in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Afrezza. I know you have a lot of questions about Afrezza. Every time I mention it, the emails and the DMs come in. So what is it all about? Afrezza is an ultra-rapid acting mealtime insulin. You breathe it in using an oral inhaler. Afrezza gives you the flexibility to eat when you want while providing proven blood sugar control. Afrezza's ultra-rapid action allows you to inhale your insulin right when food arrives, even unexpectedly. So you can be spontaneous, but still in control without the need for injections at mealtime. Find out more and see if Afrezza is right for you. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Afrezza logo. 
Afrezza can cause serious side effects, including sudden lung problems and low potassium, and is not for patients with chronic lung disease such as asthma or COPD, or for patients allergic to insulin. Tell your doctor if you have ever smoked, have ever had kidney or liver problems, a history of lung cancer, or if you are pregnant or breastfeeding. Most common side effects are low blood sugar, cough, and sore throat. Severe low blood sugar can be fatal. Do not replace long-acting insulin with Afrezza. Afrezza is not for use to treat diabetic ketoacidosis. Please see full prescribing information, including boxed warning, medication guide, and instructions for use on afrezza.com slash safety. Ned, thank you so much for joining me. We are so interested in learning more about this. Thanks for spending some time with me and my listeners. Oh, Stacey, thank you for having me. We have so many questions, but let's just start kind of big picture. If you wouldn't mind, tell me a little bit about Civica RX. This is not a new company, although for many of my listeners, this is the first time we're hearing of it. But what is the company all about? Well, Civica RX is um, a little over three years old. We were formed by uh, health systems to address chronic drug shortages in hospitals. That was the start. Uh, since then, we are starting to expand our mission. We're non stock and not for profit, and we're all here for the patients. Tell me a little bit more about the beginnings in terms of shortages in hospitals. I know that's not what we're going to talk about for the crux of the interview, but what does that mean? They were really just, they couldn't get existing drugs into hospital systems? That's right. And they're really critical medications, life-saving medications. They're mostly injectable drugs, and many of those injectable drugs are fairly low in cost. And a lot of manufacturers have uh, moved to other products and... uh, a lot of that manufacturing has moved offshore. So there's been issues with supply of the products. Typically, a generic drug for a hospital at some point in time may get so inexpensive that there's only a couple of suppliers. And when there's one supply chain issue, uh, then there's a shortage. And that causes, as you can imagine, a real issue for the hospital systems. Can you share a a success story that Civica RX has been able to supply a a particular drug or a particular hospital? Because you've done this before, is the point I was trying to make. Yeah, we have. We have. I mean, we're really proud of what we've done over the past three and a half years. We told our hospital systems, yes, we can do this. Yes, we can uh, supply up to 20 medications in five years. And uh, believe it or not, here, three and a half years later, we're at over 60 medications. Uh, And there are a lot of them. The list is quite long, uh, but these are all critical injectable medications in the hospital, such as, uh, and I will tell you that I think 11 of our drugs were critical during COVID. Mm. Uh, And our our timing was, well, it was very uh, fortunate for patients and for us too. We, We had just started up and we had, I think at that point in time, we had 19 medications already in our warehouse. And 11 of those were used for COVID patients, many who are on uh, ventilators. So how did insulin catch your eye? Why this need? Well, you know, insulin's been around for 100 years, and it is really kind of been a poster child for some of the issues we have in, in the health system. Many of us in the Civica family here have members of our family or friends who are diabetics. And, um, you know, we've seen the issue. It's, it really is uh, kind of a broken system on the retail side right now. Do you have a personal connection to diabetes yourself? Uh, my mother is a, is a diabetic, so yes, I do. I guess when I asked why tackle insulin, I'm asking that because we have been told for years and years that this is such a complicated issue that the three companies that basically that produce insulin could not possibly lower the price. I've had them on the show. Um, you know, they've talked about how they're, it's beyond their control. So how can you all come in and say, no, it's really not. We can do this for $30 a vial. I know this is a complicated question, but can you kind of break down how you're going to do it? Yeah, I think a lot of it stems from, you know, the way we're organized. Uh, Civica is non-stock, not-for-profit. So we will be taking a very different approach. The current manufacturers, uh, it's kind of a crazy system, but the current manufacturers are actually incented to raise their prices. If they raise their prices, they can give higher rebates. And if they give higher rebates, they can gain preference on formulary, as you mentioned, uh, with your personal experience, and they can gain share by being the top insulin on the formulary. We're eliminating those rebates. We're non-stock, not-for-profit. We're going to operate on a strictly a cost-plus model with no rebates. You've done this before, right? You know it can work. It just sounds so different. 
Yeah, it is. And Civica is different than any company that I've been associated with, just with our approach being non-stock, not-for-profit, essentially almost like a, a public utility, just really here to benefit the patients. Just to clarify, when you say non-stock, that doesn't refer to medical inventory, right? Not stock on the shelves. You're talking about stock market. That's right. We were formed essentially by uh, donations and loans from healthcare companies. So no one owns Civica. Not a publicly traded company. Can't buy it on the stock market. That's right. Ned, I am never afraid of asking a dumb question. So we talk about biosimilars because there really is no true generic in the, in the insulins we're talking about are Humalog, Novolog, and Lantus. But we've also, it's kind of seemed for years, again, with the dumb question, that these insulin companies have said, we're just going to tweak the formula a little bit so there can't be a generic. How are you getting your hands on, I guess, what I would call the recipe? Uh, you know, we think that there, there is actually a, a pretty clear path now that the FDA has put in place to achieve biosimilar status. And in fact, there's two recent examples where biosimilars have been designated interchangeable, which is basically generic. Uh, One of those is an insulin. So we believe we have a pretty clear path to do that. They are different than the small molecule generics that we currently sell. They do require clinical trials, and we're doing that. We believe we have a pretty clear path that's been uh, laid out by the FDA, and uh, that's the approach we're going to take. Is the one insulin that was approved that's more of a generic is Semgly? That's correct. Okay. So that's kind of what you're, you're saying. You're pointing to that to say, well, they did it. We can do it too. That's right. So when you're doing clinical trials, you have already made the insulins that you're going to be selling. You're testing them to make sure that they're safe and effective. That's right. We'll be uh, manufacturing the, uh, the drug substance, which in the small molecule world is called API or active pharmaceutical ingredient. And then we will put that into vials and uh, pre-filled syringes and use them for the clinical trial. What's the timeline in the clinical trial? And I always hate to ask about timelines, but in general. Yeah, our plan is just kind of jump into the end. Our plan is to launch the products in the U.S. market in uh, 2024. So only two years from now. Yeah. You have to make a pharmaceutical plant, right? This is not something that exists right now to create the insulins, or or is it already manufactured? Well, the really good news is that we started building a manufacturing plant already, a brand new plant in Petersburg, Virginia. It's just south of Richmond. And you can see it on our website on civicarx.org. We have the uh, plant under roof. Uh, We're finishing the interior of the plant and equipment is starting to arrive. We plan to make manufacturing runs in the plant by the end of this year and be ready to make the insulins in 2024. One of the things that advocates have said for years is that the cost of a vial of insulin is so much lower than it is sold for. You know, the profits are astronomical, even if it's sold for $30 or $35 a vial. I'm curious why you all, as a nonprofit, came up with the $30 a vial. How did you decide on that number, if you can share that information? Uh, Sure. Uh, You know, it's simply, uh, for us, a cost plus model. Uh, We did our modeling and we said, uh, okay, here's how much it's going to cost for the uh, drug substance, the vial or the pre-filled syringe, and how much it's going to cost to deliver it to the patients. And um, we, we operate on a break-even basis. So that's how we came up with the numbers. And I know it's a little unusual to tell someone what our price is going to be two years from now. Uh, I know back in my experience in the for-profit world, we would never do that. This is the approach we're taking. The other key to this, and it's the key to how we can do this, is that a lot of our startup and development costs are being funded by uh, donors, philanthropic organizations. And you see that in our press release. There's so many of them that are coming out to help us get started. And once we start up, uh, the price we charge is just enough for us to be sustainable. I'm curious too, once you start up and once you start selling, transparency has been a huge problem. Like I said, advocates have tried to figure out the cost of a vial of insulin. I don't know if that includes things like creating a brand new building creating all this stuff, you know, that you have startup costs on. I've heard anywhere from $3 to $8 for a vial of insulin. Do you anticipate making that kind of information public once you launch this? In other words, showing what it costs each step of the way. 
right back to Ned answering that question. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Omnipod. And you know I'm a big fan of choice when it comes to diabetes technology. I get so excited when there's something new because if you live with diabetes, whatever type, whatever age, you deserve to find the best fit for you. And that's just one reason I'm working with Omnipod to help spread the word about their program that makes it so easy to test their system out. It's the Omnipod Dash free trial. If you want to try an insulin pump or see what life without tubes is all about, you can now try Omnipod Dash free for 30 days. The trial comes with no commitment or obligation. Not right for you? No problem. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Omnipod logo. Terms and conditions apply. For full safety risk information and free trial terms and conditions, also visit omnipod.com slash diabetes connections. Now back to Ned answering my question about disclosing the costs of making a vial of insulin. Uh, I don't know. That's not a, uh, you know, that's not a bridge we've crossed yet. We are a very transparent organization. You know, if you take a look at our website and our press releases, we say more than, than really anybody does. Yeah. Uh, and we we can just assure folks that, you know, it's a cost plus and we're a break even organization as a not for profit. Uh, you know, I don't know about every detail of the step to the way or if that would be even useful. But, uh, boy, you can be assured that uh, we're not making a profit. Yeah, I hear you. I think it would be useful because I think it's been a big talking point for the in, the pharmaceutical companies that make insulin now that it's some kind of crazy trade secret that they couldn't possibly share. <laughs> I'm I'm curious what you think. And I don't know how much you can really say about this. But I'm curious what you think is going to happen. You know, once you put this out there, what do you think is going to happen to insulin prices across the board? You know, I don't know. You know, I don't know if the if the entire market's going to change or if the other insulin suppliers will just continue doing what they're doing. Uh, they've certainly been incented to so far. And I will tell you that from what I've seen, it appears that they're continuing to behave in the same way that they did before the launch of this one interchangeable insulin that we mentioned that you mentioned earlier. Uh, so I, I don't know. But I will tell you that our mission is not to um, gain market share. Our mission is to fix the system. So if it gets fixed, we've succeeded. How much capacity do you have? In other words, do you anticipate producing for, I, I think I read somewhere, for a third of the market? Is that correct? Yeah, we have a large manufacturing plant, uh, you know, and this is all public information. It's out there. This plant has been built to be able to manufacture 90 million vials mm -hmm. a year and 50 million syringes. And we have space for expansion uh, in that facility. So yeah, yeah, we think uh, the plant's capable of producing, uh, you know, about one third of the market. And $30 a vial, this is cash price? You just need a prescription, no insurance? That's correct. What about if you have insurance? Can you still, and I know we're a couple of years away, but most people who have insurance are looking at what's going on in Congress right now. And as you and I are talking, the House has passed a limit, a copay limit for those who have insurance. It hasn't yet gone through the Senate. So it is not yet law. The president hasn't signed it. But would your insulin pricing affect anybody with insurance? Uh, no, that's not our intention. We plan to make it available across the market. And, um, you know, if you think about it, even if there's a limit on the copay, somebody has to pay. Mm -hmm. We think it'll be available and um, it'll be beneficial to, to lots of folks. Anyone that is paying more than the prices that we're going to offer, and that would include uninsured, it would include insured folks like myself who have a high deductible, right? During that period, I pay a lot. And you probably experienced that uh, yourself. And um, it would also, uh, you know, help payers and employers that might be paying more. Yeah. No, it's great. I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to go through some scenarios because I've told the story before. My listeners are familiar. My son has type one and he's the guy who uses insulin in the house. But our insurance changed a couple of years ago. And so our insulin was not covered anymore. And I wanted to stay on it. So, oh my gosh, we had to jump through so many hoops. But this is the kind of situation where even if I have insurance, I could still not use it to buy Civica RX insulin, right? That's right. All right. Very interesting. It really is. I mean, and it's it's not to editorialize here, but I guess I'll ask it this way. By focusing on people who don't have insurance, you are really looking at a forgotten part of the American healthcare system. I assume that that is on purpose. Is that what, what some of your other medications, how you've put those out as well? Yeah, that's right. It's so interesting to me that where Washington seems to be, you know, pretty gridlocked and not making a lot of progress on American healthcare, 
companies, even not-for-profit companies, seem to be stepping in. I don't want to say Civica Rx is going to save American healthcare, but you're making a really interesting difference. Can you talk about that a little bit in terms of what's already been accomplished? Yeah, you know what I I like and what attracted me to um, Civica from the very beginning, even before we we formed the company, is that we're essentially taking a free market approach. Mm -hmm. So we can move as things change within the market. Let's say there's another problem besides insulin that we want to tackle. We can go off in that direction. I think it's very difficult for the government to do that, to have that kind of flexibility. Even though we're not for profit and non stock and not owned by anyone, you know, we're still taking a free market approach. As you said, we'll go to the market and, you know, the market will react how the market reacts. It is a very interesting model that I think can work in lots of places. Let's talk about you for a second, if if we could. You've mentioned a couple of times you you have worked in the profit healthcare industry. You worked for Abbott for a while, right? Uh, 32 years. Oh, for a while then there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, re- I retired on my 32nd anniversary day. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Without, without a plan to go to work. And I let my friends know that I had a new phone number and a new email address. It was no longer abbott.com. And uh, one of those friends is the uh, CEO of Civica. And he said, some folks were talking about starting a company. Would I come and talk to them? So that's how it happened. I fell in love with the mission and now they can't get rid of me. Huh. Well, <laughs> Let me ask you this then, again, knowing we are two years away, at least, from this project launching or being available to consumers. Do you think Civica has accomplished what you came there to do? Uh, We've made progress, but uh, I think it's just going to continue. I think uh, we'll continue to uh, support our our hospital systems in the U.S. I hope we make a big impact on on insulin, and I hope we make a big uh, impact on other medications where there's uh, issues, where they either there's a supply issue or they just cost much more than they should, especially for a product like this is essentially generic. You know, I'm curious, again, we're getting a little bit ahead of the project. You're going to do biosimilars for three insulins, Humalog, Novolog, Lantus. Any thinking about other insulins that are currently being manufactured? You know, I'm thinking of Traceba or Fiesp or Lumjev, things like that. Uh, that's yet to be determined. I mean, we're just getting started on this program. It's a big task. I think these three insulins account for about over 80% of the U.S. insulin market. So we're going to try to talk, tackle the big ones first and then uh, go from there. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not to that uh, next step yet. What does success look like for you? You launched this in 2024. We look back in 2028. What does success look like for you on this project? Oh, that's easy for me to answer. Success is going to be the impact on the patients, getting the cost down to a more manageable level for them, good supply and a more manageable cost. Folks shouldn't have to make a decision between their insulin and and other key things like housing and food, et cetera. I have to ask, and I again, I know that you have to you have other things to pay for, like this manufacturing facility, and even though you are a nonprofit, you have salaries and things like that. Would you anticipate or would you consider once it is up and running, dropping the price because $30 a vial, $55 for a box of five pen cartridges is less than a lot of people are paying right now. But still, if you need more vials, it adds up and it's still more than people pay in most other countries around the world. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the public has our commitment that we're only going to charge the cost plus enough to, to get the product to them, uh, to make it and get it to them. So uh, a- absolutely. Uh, when we did the press release, we thought about this a lot. Uh, we looked at all of our modeling, and uh, we put in things like price that we felt we can we could achieve. If it's possible to lower the price, if we can get lower cost, absolutely. That's fantastic. Before I let you go, can my listeners get into your clinical trials, or are those already set and going? Uh, it's it's already pretty set. So at this point in time, well, that's good news for timing. I mean, my my people are very interested in clinical trials, so I always like to ask. But it's good news to know that they are off and running. When this story came out, we're very excited to follow it. We're very excited to see it. I hope it all happens. But there's that little cynical part of me. You know, I've been in the diabetes community for more than 15 years now since my son's diagnosis. And I look at everything, and I hate to say this, with a a, a big grain of salt and a lot of, a a relatively normal amount of cynicism, I would say. So when my mom asked me about this, what I said to her was, I will believe it when I'm holding a vial of insulin in one hand and a receipt that says $30 in the other hand. My question for you is, reassure me that my cynicism is misplaced. 
<laughs> you know, we've heard that. And that's why we spent so much time putting together, you know, our plans and the press release that we put out, making sure we can deliver on what we say. So we're very confident. Three and a half years ago, when we formed Civica, there were a lot of cynics that said a non-stock, not-for-profit pharmaceutical company. Really? That's not going to work. But yet we were able to exceed expectations. We said we would have 20 drugs in five years, and today we have over 60. So we're very confident that we can do it. And uh, we're very confident that with uh, the way we operate, being a non-profit company with no rebates and offering low-cost product, we're very confident that we can be successful in changing this market and helping the patients. Well, I look forward to holding my receipt in one hand and my vial in the other. And I will take a picture and send it to you in 2024 <laughs> or whenever you I will, want. I will hold you to that. No problem. <laughs> Ned, thank you so much for explaining this and for spending so much time with me. I really appreciate it. Not a problem at all, Stacy. Thank you. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. If you'd like to learn more about Civica RX, go to diabetesdashconnections.com. The episode homepage will have all the links and more info. I know I sound a little cynical during that interview. I don't want to be, but you know, this has been built up to be such a difficult and complicated issue that I just don't know what to expect. And while I think personally it is disappointing that our government, federal and state, has let us down in terms of health care and controls and pricing of insulin. That's just how I feel. Sorry. I do think it's fascinating that they have found kind of a capitalist solution here. It's a little bit philanthropy, right? It's nonprofit, but it's also a market solution, as he says. So stay tuned. And uh, if I can, I don't know how I'll do this if this is for people without insurance, if I can get insulin in one hand and my receipt in the other, but I'll do the best I can when it comes out. We've got a couple of years to wait, but much more to come, of course. Up next, I want to tell you a little bit about my recent trip to Boston. A lot of you saw that on social media. I shared some photos, but of course I have a world's worst diabetes mom story with Benny on this trip, and I'll share that with you in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom, and we have been using Dexcom since Benny was nine years old. We started with Dexcom back in December of 2013, and the system just keeps getting better. The Dexcom G6 is FDA permitted for no finger sticks for calibration and diabetes treatment decisions. You can share with up to 10 people from your smart device. The G6 has 10-day sensor wear, and the applicator is so easy. I have not done one insertion since we got it. Benny does them all himself. He's a busy kid, and knowing he can just take a quick glance at his blood glucose numbers to make better treatment decisions is reassuring. Of course, we still love the alerts and alarms, and that we can set them how we want. If your glucose alerts and readings from the G6 do not match symptoms or expectations, use a blood glucose meter to make diabetes treatment decisions. To learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. I took Benny to Boston earlier this month. His top choice right now is BU, and we wanted to look at some other colleges in the area while we were up there. I don't know why both my kids want to go so far away. I promise I'm a nice mom. I love them very much. They have a nice house to live in. <laughs> but my daughter is going to school in New Orleans. We live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Benny just wants to go to Boston. So I took him up there, and it was just a quick couple of days, just him and me. And as I've shared, he is pretty independent right now. He is doing all his diabetes stuff independently. However, for my own peace of mind, I still oversee the packing of the diabetes bag. All right, I'll be honest, I still pack the diabetes bag. And not for every day, but for these trips, because it just lowers my stress level to know that when we're getting on a plane, he's got what he needs for, it was actually for a week, because after that, we visited relatives for the Passover holiday. So he's independent day to day. I have turned off all my Dexcom alarms except urgent low. I think we're at a really good place that way. You know, he's 17, he's a junior in high school. He's had diabetes for more than 15 years. But I, I needed that bag to be packed. And I also needed to make sure that he had a backpack or something that he was going to take around with us day to day because my days of carrying all his stuff, which I did when he was very young, obviously, you know, ages two to six, I, I didn't trust him. He was also so tiny to carry around everything we needed day to day. But that's been another gradual change. So he, he had a bag. He was going to carry everything with him. No problem. The first day we are Ubering here and there. We went out to Waltham, you know, a city near Boston, a, a town near Boston, I guess, looked at colleges there. And then came back in. We were staying in Cambridge and we decided to walk. It was like a 15, 20 minute walk to dinner from where we were staying. So he said to me, mom, I'm not taking my big bag. I don't need anything. You know, he's got his Dexcom. He's got his tandem pump. They work together. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but if you're not, they work together with Control IQ, the software to help regulate 
blood sugar, you know, the, the CGM and the pump communicate. But blood sugar can also be seen on the face of the tandem pump, which is really handy. And of course, he's got his phone with him, which shows everything. And there's not an external controller. You can just press the buttons on the pump. So Benny often goes out just with that and puts some low stuff in his pocket. And, and that's what we did for our walk. So of course, three minutes, five minutes, I don't know. We're very early on in the walk. And he's being a goofball, you know, just pulling his, putting his hand on stuff. I don't know why kids touch everything. He's, he's still, you know, he's 17, but he's still doing that. And he ran his arm up along a fence. And of course, ripped out the Dexcom. And he stopped and he was almost laughing because he, he says, mom, I do this kind of stuff all the time. The Dexcom never comes out. And I'm like, really? You push your arm up against a chain link fence and pull it and the, the Dexcom never comes out? Whatever, dude, you do you. And I looked at him, I said, all right, well, quick, let's get a reading. So at least we know where you are right now and we can go from there. So we looked and he was 76 going down. He's like, oh, this would be a good time to use that low stuff in my pocket. So he took a couple of tabs. He said, he feels fine. We'll, we'll keep walking. And we decided we were just going to stay out. We went to dinner. He ate massive amounts of food. Of course, this is an Italian restaurant we decided to go to. I got to tell you guys, it was so good. It was Viali in Cambridge, which is maybe a tourist trap. Who even knows? But it was, we had raw oysters. So good. We had pasta. He and I, I had a gluten-free pasta that was just amazing. He had a pasta dish. As soon as they put it down in front of him, he said, can I order a second dinner? Because it wasn't like a massive, you know, it wasn't Olive Garden portions. This was like a normal Italian restaurant. So then he got a flatbread pizza. I kid you not. And then we walked and had ice cream. So of course, he's, he's bolusing. He was dosing for all this. He has everything on him. But there's no control IQ helping out and there's no Dexcom readings going on. Of course, he was fine. You know, most of you with diabetes for a long time are nodding your head. We were out for maybe two and a half hours, went back to the hotel, slapped the Dexcom back on, you know, and he was just fine. I did share this in my local group because I think that especially for newer families, it's such a good reminder that if you don't know where your blood glucose is every second of every day, it's not a dangerous thing. It's okay to let your child sometimes feel and go by feel and things like that. And especially once we knew that he was 76 and then he had the tabs, I wasn't worried at all because I knew we were eating Italian food for dinner and that he would not be going low again. The nice part was it was early enough in the evening that Control IQ could kick in before midnight and, you know, just take care of things. There were no big highs or anything like there might have been in the olden, in the olden days just two years ago. Oh, and I also have to mention just one other funny diabetes thing about the trip. We did the Boston University formal tour. We did this at a couple of colleges where they do a presentation for you first you know, an administrator talks and a student talks. And the administrator was talking about the great internship opportunities at BU. And she gives the example, I kid you not, Ed Damiano, creator of the Bionic Pancreas, frequent guest here on Diabetes Connections. And she talked about how he had an internship opportunity that was filled by a student who lives with type 1 diabetes. So I've got to reach out to Ed and let him know that BU is, is holding him up as a great example, which, you know, he definitely is. But it was really funny. Benny was nudging me about it to the side because Benny helped Maybe last year, I think it was 2020, he helped with the, um, one of their human factor trials. So that was really funny. All right, those were our adventures in Boston. We are back to our regularly scheduled programming around here, which means the newscast episode will be live on Wednesday and then a podcast episode on Friday. And then these lengthy, more interview episodes are on Tuesdays. And that will continue until you hear otherwise from me. I reserve the right to change the schedule if needed. Lots of good information is coming up. We've got some big conferences, some, some medical conferences coming up. I anticipate a lot of technology stuff over the summer as well. All right. Thanks to my editor, John McKenis from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here in just a couple of days. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.